seems like there's been a lot of death, a lot of loss um, around us. I know just within my family, me and my brother was talking, maybe 40 to 50 family members we've lost over the last four years. And notice how uh, I chuckle as I say that. Uh, you'll notice among uh, among people of color in particular, especially African-American men, we do a lot of, we use a lot of humor to get through the most challenging um, moments of our lives. And, and, and me and my cousin, we have, a, we have a saying when we talk to each other, you know, sometimes you have to laugh to keep from crying, you know? And so there is that so uh, basically mantra or movement is really about just taking a moment and deciding what type of relationship you want to have with the present moment. And so even with the loss that we experience, even with the grief that we have, and again, my heart goes out to the families of everyone who's lost someone, not, not just the ones that I know about, but there are hundreds of people that die daily. And so my heart goes out to every last one of the families out there, known and unknown, you know. Um, what is that so says is even in these moments, you know, I take a moment and, and, and it has nothing to do with humor whatsoever. You see this mantra of mine, um, this this choice uh, to take a moment and decide what type of relationship I want to have with the present moment. Um, that's for every moment, even especially the most difficult ones. And so I've I had a you know I had a young man uh, talk to me recently about the the recent loss of the young lady from LSU, and as he was talking to me about it, you know I had to let him know, hey. Make sure that you understand what type of relationship you want to have this present moment, you know, and and it stings and it hurts. And I know it hurts. You know, it, it hurts me. You know, anytime I hear this loss because it's so intimate, you know, it, think, it makes you think of every revisit uh, just about every loss that you've ever had, you know, um, but decide how long you're in this moment. Because, you, you know, most of us haven't even had the opportunity to fully grieve over all the people that we know that we've lost, let alone the energy or the reserve to mourn for so many more that we don't know, but when we hear their stories, our hearts break for them. So is that so is really about just taking the time to decide how to respond instead of immediately reacting to the present moment. What do you say to your friend who you find out has attempted to end their life? Uh, you let them know that you are there for them and and that uh, and then basically ask them is there what is it that they need right now you know that's really the question i ask pretty much everybody what do you need right now because so little attention is paid to our needs you know and oftentimes when those needs get uh when we don't pay attention to our needs we go into a state of deprivation that deprivation leads to compulsion and it's usually in states of compulsion that we make uh, choices and decisions that we later on regret, you know? So just be there for your friend and let them know that you're there um, and then ask him, what does he need right now or, or she needs right now, you know? Well, internalized oppression is when you take, you know, whatever that um, oppression is, maybe it's sexism, racism, whatever, homophobia, whatever's being thrown at you and you take that and you put it inside yourself and you use it against yourself and against other people who are like you to hold you back and keep you down. So wait, how do you use it against yourself? Well, you take things like um, the stereotype, black people are lazy or black people are criminals. And you use that um, to begin to think that other black people are criminals. You know, you, you do that pearl clutching and holding your purse Mm -hmm. uh, when you're passing by those other black folks on the street when, you know, that's something that without this internalized oppression, you wouldn't be doing. All right. So let's talk about why are we connecting internalized oppression to relationships? Like why are we even, why, how is this even connected? You know, like, help me because out. Of, because of the disconnect, especially among black women and black men. Um, we are not, uh, getting married anymore. We're not staying together anymore. We're not, we don't have families uh, like we used to. Uh, mm -hmm. not, even with our extended families, we don't, we don't have those. And it's because of the internalized oppression, we are separating from each other and we're not finding a, a, a common ground, a way to get together.
to, to, to build our communities and build our families. It's a shame that the thing that is common or the common ground for us is, you know, so-and-so was shot or so-and-so got killed or, and the only time that we're getting together even for, you know, a, to show a little bit of vulner, vulnerability, I can't even say it, vulnerability is when we're at our funerals or, um, you know, it's, it's a, a tragedy or crisis that's going on in our families. You know, you and I, we were talking about, you know, uh, uh, we watch some of these interactions between black men and, and, and black women. And I'm so glad we talked about this independence thing, because I also noticed that among like, like our, our, our brothers and sisters, you know what I mean? It seems like a lot of the brothers, they're looking for somebody to, uh, especially those, there's a lot of brothers out there that's looking for their mama. And so mm. they want their significant other to be their mama. All right. So I noticed that. But then there's a lot of sisters out there who complain about how they're not being supported. But at the same time, when somebody come around and try to provide some support, they push them away because they don't need nobody. So I don't understand what's going on here. I'm confused. Where they do that at? Like, what's going on? Well, apparently they do that in Louisiana. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it's all yeah. about patterns. It's all about uh, what you grew up with. It's all about uh, what your your mom and your dad passed down to you. So those things that are, are being passed down to us, those are the things we're going to live with. Those are the things that affect our worldview every day. Those things that are the being passed down, the patterns. Um, go back for generations. So the, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, with how many generations we can go back with this, but you know, we can, let's, let's start with uh, just with, with slavery. So we're being taken away from each other. Okay. Mm -hmm. By force. This wasn't not even our choice being taken away from each other by force. So then we, we are, you know, forced to think of the world a different way to think of the world as I, 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 you know, rather than the way that we used to think of it as we, that mm -hmm. we can do this together. So coming down through the generations is all I, 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 um, taking away the, the we that we are used to. And it, it, we get this independence that is broken. It's not a, um, an, an independence that we can really live with in life. It's not something that we can use to, you know, connect with other people and form relationships with other people. Vulnerability. So my my thing, my mission purpose is authenticity, uh, to assist others in developing the audacity to live unapologetically authentic. That is my mission statement that I assist others with because that is my own personal mission statement because I realize that there is no freedom without authenticity, right? But also with authenticity, the requirement, there's a, there's, there's a component in there uh, in authenticity that requires you to be vulnerable. There is no authenticity without vulnerability. Um, and when it comes down to relationships, in particular among black men and black women, because I, I, and I can only speak as a black man. As a black man, oftentimes in the past, I felt very uncomfortable, and even now, you know, uh, uncomfortable being vulnerable with a lot of sisters because I know that sisters blue, would, would view any sign of vulnerability oftentimes as a weakness. And I would be penalized for that. If I am, if I am showing machismo, if I got my chest poked out, and I'm cursing it up a storm, you know what I mean? And I'm and I'm ready to fight anything around, you know what I mean? And I'm huffing and I'm puffing, puffing like a bull. Hey, yo, I'm 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 cooler than Lou Rawls, you know what I mean? Like I'm out here, you know what I mean? I'm a hot topic then, you know? Mm -hmm. So well, what is it what is it about that? Like why how do we how do we form there is no connection without authenticity, you know? And so for for uh, a African American women, uh, women and men in particular, black men and women in particular, black and brown men and women in particular, how can we be authentic if we don't feel safe being vulnerable with each other? We have to go to therapy. <laughs> 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 yeah, because we have to be able to open up to each other and um, and be vulnerable and feel those feelings and and be able to you know catch each other when we fall. And, you know, since everybody is walking around trying to be the strong person, you know, there's there's nobody to fill that role as the weak person. So we have to get back to working on ourselves. We have to get back to um, working on that inner peace that you were talking about earlier. So um, I saw uh, a new show on Netflix, you guys. I, I can't remember what the name of it is um, with Jamie Foxx. 
And the first show started out with black people don't go to therapy, <clears throat> but there were two black people sitting in a therapist's office. So, you know, at least they were, you know, making a go at it, making a trial of it. So, you know, we really have to, to get to therapy and, and try to work through some of these things ourselves, not go to therapy and talk about how all this woman wants to do is mm -hmm. take my money or how all she wants to do is uh, show off with her friends, you know, with this or that working on ourselves, not, you know, trying to work on the other person. Mm -hmm. So we gotta, we gotta go and fix ourselves first before we can, we can, really get back together. And a lot of us don't even understand what it is that we're experiencing. For some of us, you know, for many of us, if they tune into my show, this may be the first time they even heard the phrase internalized oppression. Even though the black doll, white white uh, doll test, a lot of people know about the black doll, white doll test, that was to measure internalized oppression. Mm -hmm. And we know that the children there, they were giving the, uh, attributing all the positive traits to the white doll. And these children were attributing all of the negative traits to, I'm ugly and this and that to the black doll. And I'll never forget the little girl at the end when the reporter asked, which one looks like you? And this sweet baby girl, after saying all these negative things about the black baby, this black baby doll, she pointed, she said, look like me. And she looked at both of the dolls and she pointed at the black doll. Mm -hmm. Internalized oppression, you know, and I say, I've said this before, I say it again on here, um, we, even, if, even the institutions, you know, it begins, for me, it begins with the institutions. You go through high school, and I mean, you go through the formal schooling system, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, all the way to 12th grade, and then you have a graduation. And the very word graduation can be seen as a combination of the words or the marriage of the words gradual and indoctrination. You've been gradually indoctrinated into American way of thinking. But throughout the schooling system, for uh, brown, black and brown children to learn about all of these uh, uh, great white men wearing wigs and high heels uh, and and nothing about uh, their own history or for um, and uh, a child of indigenous folk, of indigenous people to sit in a classroom where Christopher Columbus is glorified or even for white children to sit in those same classrooms and learn about a history that is told for the upper class that the aristocrats created and never really told their true story. I believe that in these formal institutions, this is where internalized oppression is really, it really begins and gets cemented in. And then after that, our experience throughout life via the media, college, friendships, whatever, begin to uh, confirm that illusion, that illusion of inferiority and superiority, you know? So how can we, how can we connect when we know that some part of us is going to be, look, when you carry around the amount of uh, tra trauma that we have, that we experience, you know, as a people, when we when we uh, carry around that much, it's bound to cause some pain. Some even, I mean, it may not be intentional, but it's bound in the connection between black a black man and a black woman. Um, there's bound to be some discomfort and some pain that will happen. What I find is that when that occurs, it's usually just it's usually wrong uh, among the connections is actually have the most promise actually. But uh, when that occurs, there's this retreating that's done. But again, Tyrone who want uh, um, little Kim over there to be his baby mama and uh, to be his mother, um, those types of relationships, there is like this extreme dedication towards, you know? And so it, it, it almost, seems like we're self-sabotaging when we have these these uh these healthier connections the moment that a healthy connection the moment that a healthy connection shows any type of you know something that we don't like we disconnect but in the most unhealthiest of of connections or the most uh unaware connections where there's the most discard the most uh, uh confrontation it seems like there's this dedication instead of we are intelligent we sound like we are talking uh white that's what people say, you know? Oh, yeah, that's yeah. my favorite one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're not intelligent. We're, we're acting white, you know? Old, uh, we're, we're, we're being uppity, you know? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> brother, brother can't read a book, you know? You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Can't, more than, can't, can't know more than seven words out of the dictionary, but go ahead. 
Yeah, that's that's another part of our internalized oppression. We can't we can't be you know acting white like that. Okay, so you know speaking to that, be your authentic self. Whoever your authentic self is, just you know be that. If your parents raised you with good diction, use it. It's fine. Black people, you know, come in the, in a, a in an array of uh, flavors and an array of taste. I mean, mm-hmm. just I was gonna say something about um, Star Wars and the Lord of the Rings, but I'm gonna leave that alone. Uh, <laughs> be your authentic self, okay? Mm-hmm. Whoever that person might be, and you know, even if it's not everyone's cup of tea, it's it's gonna be somebody's. Have that curiosity about yourself. What is it that you like? What is it that you enjoy? And whenever uh, uh, Lakeisha, Ms. Winters, was talking about being authentic, and I'm going to turn it back to you so we can go after this. So I, when Ms. When, when Winters was talking about being authentic, understand this. She was talking about breaking life patterns. That is something that is inherited to you. The patterns, when we talk about these patterns from generation to generation, that's something that you inherited. So understand what is inherent to you versus what is inher- uh, what you've inherited. So what is authentic to you? So if you authentically share with people, je- you may have been told, or you may have been hurt from sharing, more than likely you have been hurt from sharing, and you've probably also been told that you should not share. But then when it comes down to meeting or being in a space where not only you it's welcome to share, but it's actually healthy to share, we don't know how to do it because we practice not sharing and holding ourselves back. Just like speaking, you told uh, to be seen and not uh, speak, to be to be seen but not heard, or or heard but not seen, something like that. You know what I mean? That's foolish. Just shut up and don't be seen. Don't be seen or heard. You know what I mean? So when it comes down to using our voice, we practice not being heard so often and sounds our voice so often that we don't know how to speak up for ourselves. We don't know how to be assertive. And so we're always waffling in this fight or flight state where oftentimes it leads to either us being hyper aggressive towards a situation or completely retreating immediately when we get scared. We don't even know how to deal with fearful situations because nobody, not well, I had a great upbringing, let me just say that, but you know, I had my people in my life right. show me, but a lot of other folk, I'm going to say I was blessed and I'd be one of those, but a lot of other folk didn't really have that example, that training, what to do and how to stand there in fear, yeah. you know, grit, grit, you know, grit. People, when you were talking about depression and and uh, and, and fear and, and it's it showing itself in anger, a lot of people don't understand that a lot of these aggressive behaviors that they see being exhibited by other folk, especially people of color, is us being terrified. We are in a, const, a constant state of fear. And because of that, when you're in a fight or flight state, that super aggressive reaction that you find, for them, the threat level, the action that they take is equivalent to the threat that they see. So if they flash out why they have two baskets with them in Walmart and wearing a damn head net, I don't like seeing it either. But, you know, if you see somebody flash out like that, you know, it's they're seeing a threat that's equivalent to the aggression that they are exhibiting, even if you don't see it. You know, and so understand that you're seeing somebody who's traumatized. A lot of the stuff that we see on a daily basis that we uh, that a lot of people are repulsed by, it's actually people exhibiting exhibiting PTSD or complex PTSD, but not being treated for it. And so, yes, we definitely need therapy.